On today's podcast, episode 768, uh, you're about to listen to a conversation with my good friend, Joe McCall. Now, if you guys don't know Joe, Joe is has been in real estate investing and in the education space for well over a decade. He is uh, one of the most sought after thought leaders in the real estate investing arena. And Joe is just a, a wealth of knowledge, somebody who, uh, family man, man of faith, has a heart for helping others achieve financial freedom through real estate. And on today's podcast episode, we're going to dive into a very specific niche that Joe got involved in several years ago. And uh, one of the things I think about when I think about Joe is aside from him just being a quality, quality, quality dude, is that he's an expert when it comes to flipping properties remotely, whether it's single family or what you're about to hear and for some of you discover, is land investing. Now, what's really cool is that Joe has a very simplistic way in which you guys can profit from land, not just today, but ongoing. And we're going to explain on today's podcast, but he does this all without having to speak to the seller. And in fact, I don't know that that I heard him necessarily have to have any conversations to get this done. Like that's how awesome of a, and a simple of a system he has set up for anybody to be able to do this. So whether you're looking to do your first deal or whether you're a seasoned investor that listens to the podcast and you want just an additional income stream, Joe's going to show you and tell you exactly where you can find these deals and how he does it um, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis and how a lot of his clients are doing the same thing. So guys, I think you're going you're gonna to get a lot out of today's show. Um, and this is a very specific niche asset class that doesn't have nearly as much competition as single family. So uh, I truly believe this is something anybody can do. And so if you're looking to generate cash now or cash flow or even cash later, then I think this episode is going to be for you. Let's dive right in. You're listening to Flip Empire, the show committed to helping real estate entrepreneurs who want to build their empire without sacrificing their life. Your success and freedom starts now with your host, Alex Pardo. My friends, uh, I am uh, I am really, really looking forward to this podcast episode. So I am going to be introducing you for some of you. And for most of you, you're going to know exactly who this gentleman is. But a good friend of mine, Joe McCall, somebody who um, I've looked up to for a long time and somebody who I've learned a lot from throughout the years. Uh, and he may not even know that, but just uh, he was one of the originals, one of the OGs in the real estate space when it comes to podcasting. Something that I've been doing, people tell me I've been doing it for a long time, a little bit over eight years. Well, Joe's been doing it for a lot longer than I have. And uh, just one of the thought leaders in our space, somebody who um, really has a heart for wanting to help and impact people, change people's life through real estate. And um, and just somebody who every time he speaks, like there's not that many people that when they speak, I just kind of stop and listen. Joe's one of those people. So I want you, this is going to be one of those podcasts that I'm going to encourage you guys to listen to again, because there's likely going to be an opportunity for you to pick up something that you maybe didn't hear the first time. And Joe's always, hopefully Joe, I'm not putting you on the spot, but Joe's always kind of just dropping nuggets and just sharing wisdom. So um, we're going to be talking about something that I was sharing with him before we started recording that, you know, 767, 68 episodes in. And I, I can't remember the last time we dedicated an episode to land investing. And how powerful of a strategy and just a niche that is within real estate. And, you know, when I think about Joe McCall early on, I used to think about wholesaling lease options. And Joe just kind of perfected that strategy. He was known for that. He had a course and helped a lot of people become very wealthy with that strategy. And over the last several years, and I'm going to ask him that to kind of start this episode as I interview him here, but, you know, he transitioned into land investing. And so with that being said, Joe, dude, it is, uh, I want to say this is the second or third time that I now have you on the Flip Empire show, man, but I, I really appreciate our friendship and it's awesome to have you on. Alex, thank you, man. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. It really is. And it's cool to see you and your journey and how long you've been doing podcasting and uh, you've been sticking at it for a very, very long time. I go through phases where I'm like, I do a lot of episodes and then I kind of like, don't do many. I need to be more consistent. Uh, but I love podcasting. I've been yeah. doing it for 13 years now, and wow. um, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, I I got started doing uh, houses, and I was um, 
uh, I was, I was, at the beginning, I was trying to do all the different strategies. I was trying to do short sales and rehabbing and buy and hold and subject twos and lease options and trying to be a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. I was a course junkie. I, I, I like to say I was a professional student for three years um, before I really started doing deals. And I had a good friend at the time who was just, who knew me better than I knew myself. And he was like, Joe, you, you, you keep on trying to do all these different things. You just need to focus on one thing. You need to focus on one thing. And I was working as a civil engineer on a power plant <clears throat> and uh, wanting to quit my job. I was making good money. I had no complaints. Very grateful for the, the amount of money I was making. I was so, I had a lot to be grateful for. And um, I had three kids at the time, young, young kids. So I, I decided, you know what? I'm going to focus on just one strategy. And I started focusing on lease options. And this was 2009. Yeah. And I started, I didn't want to, at the time, the market was free falling, you know, and I didn't want to hold on to anything. I didn't want to own any property. I just wanted to wholesale. But it was way easier. Even back then, people think it's, oh, it's too competitive. I mean, people have been complaining about competition forever. And even when the market wasn't competitive, when it was going down, people were still complaining about comp competition. It was so yeah. hard. So anyway, I, I was complaining about competition at the time because there were a lot of wholesalers out there, I thought. Um, it's all perspective, isn't it? It's That's right. Crazy. Um, and I remember, yes, yeah, people, if they're not complaining about not enough sellers, it's they're something complaining else. about not enough buyers. That's right. right. It's, it's, it's always something. There's, it's either the bank's fault or the government's fault or uh, there's too, much, too many hedge funds coming in or there's not enough hedge funds. There's, there's always something. But I was complaining, and so I decided, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stick with lease options because I found at the time it was easier to get. I could give sellers whatever price they wanted as long as they were willing to wait for it. And so yeah. I gave them lease option offers, and then I would wholesale that lease option offer to a tenant buyer, and I'd be in and out of the deal. I'd made a quick three to five grand on average, not much, but I would do four or five, well, three or four of those a month. That was enough for me to quit my job back in. Um, Oh, 09. And I was making more money doing that part-time than I was in my full-time job. And I started doing that. And so I really fell in love with lease options. A lot of people started asking me then to teach them how to do lease options. So I started teaching people how to do lease options. And um, that opened up a whole nother opportunity and another door of like in the uh, knowledge industry and in the, the yeah. education space. Yep. And I fell in love with teaching and coaching and helping people. So but fast forward about three, four years to 2012, um, I saw a bunch of money coming back into the market. A lot. This is 2012. A lot of buyers were coming back in, buying deals, and there were properties were super cheap. And sellers at that time were a lot more open and willing to negotiate big discounts on their properties. That's right. So I started doing regular cash wholesaling um, and doing really, really well. In fact, we weren't even marketing for sellers. We were just marketing for buyers because there were so many people out there that would just bring us their deals. And um, so we started wholesaling a lot of houses. Fast forward another seven years or so. And um, so I, I stopped, I kind of still was doing lease options, but I started focusing on house wholesaling, cash wholesaling. Fast forward again, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to start focusing on something different. Because, you know, the definition of an entrepreneur is find something that works <laughs> and then stop, stop doing, doing it. it and do something yeah. else, right? That's right. That's right. So I decided, look, I, I, I wanted at this point, I wanted to do real estate with my older teenage boys. My, right. I had four kids. My two older kids at the time were 13 and 14 or something. Mm. And so I wanted to do deals with them, but I didn't want to train them to negotiate with sellers um, you know, and, and, and understanding repairs and, and ARVs and all the intricacies and complexities of house wholesaling. When you're talking to a seller who's lived in that house for 30 years or Trend. a landlord who's tired and has spent, put hundreds of thousands of dollars in that property. Like that's a totally different animal that you can't really just have a 13 year old kid talk to those kinds of sellers. So I started thinking about land and I had some um, friends and I had some clients and students that were actually making more money doing land at the time. So I started doing that. And then I developed a system in a way for my boys to start doing land deals. And over a couple, three years, doing it very, very part-time with my kids, 
the deals I did with my two boys, we we made about one hundred fifty three thousand dollars while wow. selling vacant land with my boys. And I was doing other deals on my side, but so here's my point in bringing all of that together was the cheese is constantly moving. And mm-hmm. there's that book, Who Moved My Cheese? I haven't read it in 20 years. I need to read it again. But that had a huge impact on me because I realized, that, you know, wealth doesn't disappear when the markets go up and down. Money doesn't disappear. It just transfers. It goes from one place to another. And there are times when it's easier to do certain kinds of deals. You know, there was a time when short sales were the thing and everybody, yeah. and there was a time when cash wholesaling or lease options or subject twos or storage units or commercial or, um, and so I have, I have seen personally for me, I love land because there's a lot less competition. It's a lot easier to just set up systems and do automated things where you don't have to talk to sellers. If you don't want, you just send offers and you send a lot of offers and one out of every 30 to 50 offers gets accepted. It's a numbers game. And then there's still a lot of people that want to buy land and I sell them. I buy it cheap and I sell it cheap, just like regular household selling. And so I found it's a lot, I like doing land a lot easier. It's easier to do it from your computer, from anywhere in the world. You don't have to yeah. talk to sellers. Um, and you just you just flip them. It's paper. It's We're just wholesaling paper. That's all we're doing. Well, brother, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. And I there's several questions I want to ask you specifically about your strategy with land. And one of the things you said that I caught was, I think I heard you say without having conversations or without talking to sellers, and I find that that's one of the areas that trips up a lot of single family investors is the conversation, the negotiations. Yeah. There's, you know, oftentimes when we're talking about houses, there's an emotional attachment to the house or there's some type of financial distress or circumstantial distress, uh, house distress. There's all these things that we need to be able to like carefully navigate when we're having conversations with single family owners. Um, I want to backtrack for a, for a, just a minute or two. There's a few things that you said. There's a lot of things you said that I, I want people to really just, I want to highlight and underscore for people is you, you said that you decided to focus on one strategy and that's when things started to turn around for you. But what I also caught in kind of like the intro part of this show, Joe, was that, you know, you talk about who moved with my cheese, right? Like you're also very in tune. It's like you have your finger on the pulse with when to shift strategies because to your point, you're 100% right. Wealth doesn't disappear. It it transfers. And so what is the balance for you, if that's the right word to use here, between focus on the one thing, you know, like Gary Keller talks about in the book, The One Thing, and also understanding, having a pulse on the market and where things are shifting. Like, in other words, how is it that you, what would be your advice for people listening that understand the value and importance of focusing on one thing? But also knowing that, hey, when it's time to shift, it's time to shift. Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if I know the answer to that because it's different for everybody. Uh, I get bored easily. That's a problem that I have. So uh, I'm constantly, I'll admit, I'm constantly chasing shiny objects. So I'm I'm constantly pulling myself back and saying, hey, hmm. stop. Yeah, let's, just, let's get this thing going. Let's make... So uh, I had a friend one time to tell me, hey, listen, I don't take on anything unless I know I'm going to make a million dollars with it. I don't know. That's interesting, right? Like, okay, so that's a great filter. Maybe it's $100,000 for somebody who's just getting started. Maybe it's a million. Maybe it's 10 million. But for me at the time, I was like, that's a great idea. So I really, am I when I'm looking at options and we're constantly, in fact, the more success you have, the more money you have, the more people you hang out with that are successful, you get so many opportunities bombarded. Yeah, at you, right? You see somebody else is doing it, and you think, man, if that idiot can do it, then I can do it, right? Uh, well, so I started asking myself, okay, that's a great idea. I love that, but can I make a million dollars with that? Um, can I make a million dollars in 12 months with that? Can I make a million dollars in one month with that? And so start thinking bigger. And there's yeah. a great book, 10X is Better Than 2X. Yep, I have it right there. So, but I've been really looking at like all these different opportunities. Can I make a million dollars with that in a year? Um, and what's it going to take to do that? And if it's a no, all right, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to shelf it. I'm not going to throw it away. I'm just going to put it on the shelf and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. Give me some time to think about it. Yeah. So when it comes to land, I was thinking of that. Can I turn this into a million dollars? Yes. And then also for me, I was thinking, all right, I have a big podcast audience. I have a list. 
Um, and I started talking about these land deals that I was doing. And a lot of my audience was like, Joe, how do you do that? Can you teach us how to do that? And so I started thinking, can I make a million dollars doing land? Yes. All right. Can I make $10 million teaching people how to do land? And the answer for me was yes. So I knew this was a good opportunity. Um, and I and I talk about this all the time. Robert Allen, uh, this is why I love the publishing industry and, and education and teaching and coaching and selling software and done-for-you marketing services and things like that. Robert Allen said, I've made my millions doing real estate. I've made my hundreds of millions teaching wow. people how to do real estate. Powerful. And so I love the fact that I get to teach and help people and and I get amazing testimonials of people that are doing deals that have quit their job or spending more time with their family, have found financial freedom. So, I, you know, I still do deals, but that just is a, is a small thing. I do that so I can keep my knife sharp, you know. Uh, I want to be able to know what's going on in the market and what's working and what's not. But what I actually love doing, what my passion is, what really scratches my itch, you know, I keep a back scratcher here at my desk. <laughs> That's good. That's an old school one too. Everyone should have one of these things. It's just a bamboo stick, you know. I won't That's do it right now. But mine is my like, wife, although I, it doesn't work whenever I want it to. I can't always right, just call my exactly. wife and ask her like scratch my back. So, yeah. But we all have an itch to scratch, right? Yeah. So for me, it's like I love to teach and coach and do podcasts and YouTube videos. And, it, you know, it happens to make a lot of really good money as well. Yeah. So... That's that's kind of where I was at. Like I can make a million dollars doing that. So it, everybody, you you might we're all in different places, and you for someone it might be, can I make a hundred dollars doing this strategy? So another great question to ask along with that is, what's my fastest path to cash? Mm-hmm. What's my fastest path to cash? If you're facing different options or different strategies, take a look at it and think which can make me the most money the fastest. Right, this this or this. And many times when you're faced with these decisions and you, and you don't know which choice to make, sometimes it's just best to step back and say, what, what's the fastest path to cash here, yeah. number one? And then number two is, which can make me a million dollars faster? What, where can I make a million dollars? Is this just a great idea that I maybe I can make $100,000, $500,000 with? So I'm not all about money, but at the same time, it's like when you phrase when you're looking at different strategies and different entrepreneurial businesses and journeys and the things that you can do and paths that you can take, start thinking about, you need to, you need a filter. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. And, and this is the power of having a one-on-one conversation or a podcast or, you know, going to an event. It's that somebody can plant the seed just by asking a simple question like your friend did and it automatically just gave you the permission to think bigger. And you've done that for me, not even knowing it. You know, it's well, it made me think bigger, but it also forced me to start saying no. That's right. To more things. That's right. To be more laser focused. Well, and you referenced, I think you alluded to the book 10x is easier than than 2x by Dr. Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan, which by the way, anything that guy authors is just it's a must read. And one of the biggest takeaways for me, and by the way, it's not the 10x of like the Grant Cardone 10x, but the big takeaway for me was Oftentimes, it's easier to 10x by removing, not necessarily adding. Yeah. Right. And and that was just yeah. a big one for me because, to your point, entrepreneurs, we do things that works and then we stop doing it and we're looking for this and we're looking for that. And I've fallen into that trap as well. And so that book really just kind of put things in perspective for me, which is why my focus these days have been storage. But I'm I'm curious. And so I, this is a podcast and, and I'm hoping at the end of this, I'm now not looking at land and stuff. But um, <laughs> talk to us about. Okay, so we understand why you like land. And I there's people listening to this that are like, well, wait a second. You just send offers? Like you don't talk to people, you just send offers? What is step one? Like how are you, if I'm in somebody's shoes and I'm thinking, okay, I'm interested in land, like step one, I'm thinking, okay, well, where in the country am I focusing? And then how do I get my list on land so that I can actually just, and then contact these people so I can send offers to them? Yeah, yeah. So let me just tell you how I do land deals. It's very yeah. simple. Very, very simple. I go and find using sites like Landwatch and Redfin and Zillow, like where are the hot markets right now in the US? Where are the counties where there's in the last 90 days, there's been a lot of vacant land transactions. It might be in the city. It might be out in the suburbs. It might be rural in the country in the sticks. If I'm looking at, all right, I want to do deals in Ohio. Where is everybody buying land in Ohio right now? And you can tell that from looking at sites like Landwatch, uh, even list source, 
um, for free on list source, uh, Redfin, Zillow, and you can go see where the pockets are. Where's all the activity happening? I'm following the money. I'm following the the demand. I, I'm looking, where's the cheese, right? Well, okay. okay. In this county, there's been 200 transactions in the last vacant land transactions in the last 90 days, six months, whatever. And in this county, so I'm following the demand. And then I find, okay, in that county, what are the best zip codes? What zip codes were most of the activities happening? And then from there, I pull a list of vacant landowners. I pull a list of people who own land over 10 years, sometimes five, but usually yes. they've owned land for over 10 years and they don't live in that zip code. So the mailing address zip code is different than the property zip code is. And that's it. You know, I don't care about, I don't stack my lists. I, you know, I just want somebody who owns land for a long time who doesn't live next door to it. Okay. And I pull a list and I send ugly postcards. Do you remember the third notice postcards? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, those work fantastic for land, but I've softened the language. That old postcard used to say, we were very aggressive a yeah. minute ago. Uh, the language used to say, I've been trying for hours to call you and I haven't been able to reach you. And mm -hmm. it said, uh, keep this secret. Don't tell anybody, you know? Yeah. But yeah. so I took that language out, but it's just basically says, Hey, I would need to talk to you about your 3.6 acre vacant lot in such and such city. It's important that you call me, call this 24 hour recorded voicemail. And there's a reference number on each postcard. And so I tell them, call this 24 hour recorded voicemail. And I'm getting on average, like with, with, when you send direct mail to houses, you're lucky if you get half of 1% response rate on a piece of on a postcard or whatever. It used to be a lot better than that. Yeah, but you're lucky if you get half of 1% response rate. With land right now, we're getting 3 to 10% response rate. Really? With with our postcards. Yeah, because there's just not as much competition. There's not as much direct mail being sent to landowners as there is for houses. Yeah. So we send this postcard and we send them to a voicemail because I don't want to answer phones. I don't want to pay for live answering service. And the voicemail just says something like, hey, thanks for calling. We're vacant land investors. Usually when you want to sell your land, you're faced with a couple choices. Number one, listing it with an agent or doing for sale by owner. But if you just want to sell it for cash in 30 days, we might be interested in buying your property. So at the tone, leave your name and number and that reference ID on that postcard. Now we ask for a reference ID because off, I'm not doing the voicemail anymore. Yeah. We ask for the reference ID because vacant land usually doesn't have an address. Right? It's just maybe a street. Um, and then the APN number or the parcel ID is really long and mm -hmm. we don't want them to just leave their name because it's hard sometimes to understand yeah. how to spell their name and, and then to look it up. But if we have a reference ID, which is a really short code, then we can look it up real quick. So, you know, we get a bunch of people that call, hang up, a bunch of people that uh, leave voicemails and they also will text us their reference ID. And then we look the property up. And we've got a list of a thousand records, let's say, and they give us a reference ID. We can see that, okay, it's a 2.6 acre lot. And here we find the GPS coordinates, the APN number. We look up the property. We look to see if it has road access. Does it have, um, is it in a floodplain or flood zone or wetlands? Um, the basic things real quick. And then we send them an offer. We don't call them back. Now you can if you want, but we send them an offer at usually about 40, 30 to 40 cents on the dollar. Okay. So if we think we can sell it for 10 grand, we're going to make an offer for three grand. Never make an offer more than 50% of what we, of the, of what we think we can sell it for. Yeah. So we look at active comps and sold comps and we just figure out, we get an average price per acre in that area. Now it's a little harder to comp vacant land than it is houses. With houses, it's easy because you can just find similar size houses built in the same time area, time, time and zoom out until you get a 10. But with land, we, we have to zoom out a lot more and we look for average price per acres on solds and active listings. Okay. And then we figure out, okay, you know, if everything else is selling for $20,000, we're going to sell ours for $18,000. And then 50% of that is 9,000. And so I might offer 7,000. That's it. So we just send an offer Super for simple. seven grand. Yeah. Very, very simple. Send an offer for seven grand. And we know it's a numbers game. We get about one out of every 30 offers accepted. Now, that depends on the county. Some areas that are more competitive, maybe it's one out of 50 offers. Even if it's one out of 100, it, it, it's a numbers game. So you send out 100 offers, you're going to get one or two accepted. And then what happens if they accept our offer, then we talk to them. 
Uh, we do a little more due diligence. You know, we have 90 days to close on our contracts. We don't do any earnest money. Um, we have 90 days to close. We can cancel it for any reason. Sometimes we close quicker. You know, if we know it's a good deal, we'll close sooner. We'll take it down. Um, but then when we sell them, we, we, we hire realtors. We go find other realtors that have sold land in that area. And okay. because we're only going into areas where there's already a lot of activity, it's really easy to find these realtors that are willing to list and sell the properties, you know, for 20 grand, 30 grand or something. And we pay them generous commissions, about 10% commissions. Really? So okay. More, um, but we, we, we will, we'll, we'll hire a realtor to sell the property. Now, sometimes realtors will not, well, they won't want to list it unless we own it. Um, so we do a couple different things at that point. We might call other realtors until we find one that's willing to list it for us. If okay. we know it's a good deal, we'll go ahead and just close on it. We'll take it down. We'll buy it. Usually we <clears> hold it on average of a couple, three months, but we, you know, we usually we're buying these properties for five or 10 grand. Right? Yeah. These are really cheap properties, and we're selling them for you know double that. So, on a, my average profit on a land deal is about ten thousand dollars is what, what I what I'm shooting for. Sometimes we do a lot more, sometimes we do a little less, um, and that's it. You know, I met a guy the oh. other day. In fact, I'm talking to him later in a certain county. I can't tell you where, but he's only making one or two grand profit on each deal, but he's doing forty to fifty of them a month. What? Just wholesaling these properties, and yeah, he's you know he's doing webinars to find these buyers. But there's a lot of money out there. Like people are just looking yeah. for that. You know, they're either buying these properties for. Let me explain. Let me rewind. Why do sellers sell these things for so cheap? They just don't care. It's like they it's don't just sitting out there. Yeah, yeah. It's just sitting out there. They haven't been there in ten years. They didn't even know they owned it until their husband passed away, and they're going through the estate and like, oh, he owns a bunch of land. They just are tired of it. They don't want it. They don't care about it. There's not the emotional attachment to it. Who buys this land? You know, it, it's everybody. It's like people who want to buy land to go camping, to go hunting, uh, just a place to get off the grid if you know what uh, happens or you know who yeah. gets elected. Like, yeah. They just want a place they can get off the grid. Uh, they want to go place where they can shoot their guns maybe or hide their guns. Um uh, ride their four wheelers, go camping. Sometimes people will buy land as just a, a way to park their money that's safer than the yeah. stock market. You know? Land banking. Um, they just want to put their money there. Maybe they'll build a house on there someday. Maybe they'll build a cabin. But we go out and we buy cheap land. That's typically where I like to go. Not in the city where you know land's selling for a hundred grand. I like to go out where land is selling for fifty grand. You know, at the cheaper area. Um, and so that's you know. I don't care who buys it, right? I'm I'm only going into the markets where there's already a lot of activity. Right. There's already buyers buying land. So I'm going I'm fishing where the fish are. And uh so usually we we sell our properties pretty quick in one or two months, maybe three months max. Okay. Because we we're selling them aggressively. We're wholesalers. Just like a wholesaler gets a house super cheap, you want to sell it super cheap to somebody else who's going to, you know, fix it up and rehab it. Um <clears throat> clean it up, put tenants into it or whatever. That's who we're selling our properties for too. Got it. We're not so, trying to get top dollar. I'm curious. I remember when we were, when we had our wholesaling operation in South Florida, about three, it was, it was like 71%, but basically three out of four contracts got to the closing table that we got paid on. We'd have like a one out of four fallout rate. I'm curious, do you, what are your KPIs when it comes to I heard you loud and clear say one out of about every 30 offers we get under contract out of those. So if, if you're doing X amount of these per month, right? And it takes yeah. an average 60 days or so, how many of those are actually closing and how many are falling through because maybe you just couldn't find a buyer? About two thirds we'll, we'll actually okay. close on. Okay. And about a third, we just can't find a buyer. And that's the great thing about it too. It's a, because I, I never lose money on a deal. Yeah. Because I yeah. don't you buy don't it money. unless I know I have a buyer to sell it to, right? Um, now, worst, worst case, we've done this before where we have bought a property, we've closed on it, we own it, um, and we can't maybe sell it um, to a cash buyer. But mm -hmm. when we advertise it with owner financing, we'll, we get tons of calls. And so that's a great thing about, normally we just wholesale things, you know, you can make a quick nickel or a slow dime. Yeah. So you can make a quick nickel and sell them, but if you can't, or some people just do this on, on all of their deals. You can sell them on owner financing on mm. usually five to 10 year notes and uh, make great, incredible cash flow. You can buy these things for 10 grand, sell them for 20 grand on owner financing, 10% uh, over five years, maybe 10 years. 
and um, get great cash flow on these things. And think about it with with vacant land, you don't have to deal with repairs and maintenance and great. tenants, and toilets, and all leaky faucets and or leaky roofs and none of that. It's it's much more. It's really really good cash flow. Now the default rate is higher than it is for houses, but sure, it's easier to find buyers because with land banks don't finance land right typically i mean usually it needs to be a bigger property you need to have something that you're going to be doing with it but banks just do not like to find do offer financing on little two acre lots in the middle of nowhere florida uh but when when you as an investor you buy a property 50 60 cents on the dollar you can sell it with owner financing for 100 110 cents on the dollar yeah there's a lot of buyers. So for every one call we get from a cash buyer, we'll get four or five <clears> calls from owner financing buyers, people wanting to buy it with owner financing. Yeah. Imagine, so yeah, 100%, imagine uh, for those listening, having a bunch of these notes spitting off, you know, I don't know, 100, 200, 300, 400 grand a month, uh, a month just uh, $400 a month. Think about how many of those it's going to take to like, Put a dent and move the needle in your life. Not that many. Oh, geez. I, I show these numbers to people. Like, uh, here, I learned this strategy from a guy uh, named Scott Todd, and he works with Mark Podolsky um, at the Land Geek. Great guys. I like them. I recommend. Mm -hmm. um, but he talked about this. I, one of my first interviews on a, my podcast, talking to somebody who does land. And he talked about he was getting ready to get fired. From his job. I think he was with Hertz. He was in the executive team and uh, he saw the writing on the wall. And so he started doing land. And I forget his the exact numbers, but within about a year, he just started buying little little pieces of land, selling them on owner financing. And within about a year, he was making more money from the cash flow on that land than he was on his job. And he Incredible. did get fired, and he, but he was able to just easily leave from the cash flow on the owner financing. So, like, I, I tell this to people, and I don't know why they don't believe me or don't do it, but like, it is so ridiculously easy to get cash flow from vacant land, way easier than houses. I mean, think about how many houses you have to buy to get to $10,000 a month in cash flow. I, I have a spreadsheet here. If I had it open, I could show you the numbers, but it's like, you'd have to buy a ton of houses, plus take on a ton of debt and and put down a bunch of money in down payments. And banks only only finance a certain amount, and with interest rates with the way that you just can't yep. do it. Yep. But even if you were to borrow private money or hard money from land deals, um, the cash flow is insane on these things, and the cash on cash return. Oh, I'm sure that'd be ridiculous. Like, you're, yeah, you're lucky if you can get eight to ten percent cash on cash return in the first year on a house, right? Maybe twelve percent if you're lucky using debt leverage, right? Mm -hmm. But with land. It's it's hard to not get fifty percent cash on yeah, cash return. I, I believe it. I believe you get it. your money back in usually one and a half years. Um, yeah, the cash flow. It's are it's awesome, and you only need maybe ten or twelve properties to replace your income on your job. By, by the way, Joe, you talked about how many houses you need to make ten grand. Well, I remember when I started building a small rental portfolio in Cleveland. We got up to five houses, and you know, I thought three four hundred bucks a month. Uh, in cash flow on these houses until I had a furnace I had to replace or a roof or something. And then my cash flow is gone. For one the vacancy. Year. Well, one vacancy, right? three, four, five months. Now my cash flow is gone for the year, right? And you have all these headaches in the property management company. And with land, obviously, yes. you don't have any of that. Um, yeah. Brother, as we start to wind down the show here, man, and, and I can see why people, why this is such an awesome asset class. And by the way, I want to I wanna give you credit. One of the things that I think you have a gift for is, and I, I'm being super genuine when I say this, is you have a knack for taking something that people would maybe overcomplicate and you have a very simple way to teach and explain. That's one of the things I've always just noticed and appreciated about you is you can pretty much take any concept, whether it's wholesaling lease options or investing in land and just break it down in a very simple way. And I love how you've made it formulate. Like I think you talked yeah, about, you know, you, more, no more than 50. Like, it's just, it's very, it's simple. Anybody can do this, right? So yeah, um, thank you. before I ask you my last question, where can people, for anybody who's heard enough and they're like, I want to get involved or I want to add this to what I'm already doing, where's the best place to reach out to you? Obviously you have a podcast, so I want you to talk about that. Um, but where's the best place to connect with you? Couple, uh, my YouTube channel. I got a lot of videos on land on my YouTube channel. Uh, just go to jo YouTube, do a search for Joe McCall. You'll see my channel there. 
Uh, I also do this. Uh, I have the seven dollar class that I do every Saturday. It's recorded, but every Saturday, um, it's seven dollars. Where I I basically show, hey, if I were to go into a brand new market and start all over again from scratch, what would I do? And I'll uh, I show how I pick a market, how I get the list, how I send the marketing, how I make the offers, and all of that stuff. Wow! If you go to JoeMcCall.com slash Saturday, JoeMcCall.com slash Saturday. It's a seven dollar class. You can go in and watch it. Um, and in that class, I talk about I teach almost everything, and then I, I get I make an offer at the end. If you want to get my course, I have a, a program about that. Um, so yeah, that's Incredible. YouTube channel. Yeah, and my uh, JoeMcCall.com slash Saturday. I love it, man. For the for the cost of a Starbucks coffee in most cities. Yeah. Seven bucks, you can pretty much learn this thing from start to finish. Uh, and then your your podcast, the, the name of the podcast, and obviously it's on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, but Real Estate yeah. Investing Mastery that right has there. been around Real for estate. yeah, 13, I need to update years. my logo. This logo is about 14 years old. <laughs> but, but it's so recognizable, man. Every time I see like the red, white, and blue houses and like the, I just, you know, it's Joe McCall. So I, I don't know, man, I, I think about that, but uh, but yeah, definitely check out Joe's podcast. It's again, one of the originals in the real estate space. And dude, how many episodes you got to have? A couple thousand, a couple thousand episodes, 2,500. Amazing. Yeah. I, Amazing. I, I lost track. I, I, I used to keep track of all my metrics, you know, and the downloads and all of that, but I don't know, man. At 20, so I'm, I'm not even at 800 and I've been doing it for eight years. You're at 2,500 and that's just, man, that's just talk about like, you talked about, you, you didn't give yourself enough credit. You said, I'm not consistent. Sometimes I go through seasons. Brother, 2,500 episodes. I mean, I don't care how you slice it. You're consistent. Maybe not every single week, but like you're committed to podcasting. You know, do you want to know a little trick? What's that? This thing. When you're driving, yeah. I do these episodes called REI in your car. Yep. I've heard and, of uh, While I'm driving, I'm just thinking about something. I'm like, hey guys, how you doing? Joe here. And uh, I was just thinking about and I start talking about something related to business or real estate. And I'll just email that to my podcast editor. That's it. It's a show. At, yeah, it's a show. Done. Yeah. Yeah. People people overthink things and overcomplicate them. And, and the one thing I think people will take from you, aside from everything else you've shared, is just uh, simplicity, scales, right? Complexity uh, doesn't. And I, I don't know who said that. Uh, but you don't well, overthink things. Um, uh, what's the phrase? Is it success is... Uh, complexity is the enemy to success. Yeah. That's it. Something, uh, something well, like that. I, right? And it just hit me. It's simplicity scales, complexity fails. Uh, I, yes. I, I didn't make that up. I heard that somewhere, but it always stuck yes. with me. So awesome, man. Um, well, brother, last question. What is, for, for anybody listening to this, um, obviously, if you're interested in land, Joe is the guy to learn from. It's just very simple and formulaic, like I already talked about. What do you find holds people back? from wanting to get involved in this particular asset class? Because you've made it, it's, it, it sounds very simple. Anybody can do this. What do you find out of all the, the hundreds or thousands of people you've worked with now, what's holding people back that people need to be aware of so that they don't have that limiting belief or so that they can let go of that limiting belief? Oh, the, I think it's fear. They're afraid of the unknown. They've never done it before. Um, so how do you overcome fear? I don't know the answer to that. Like, you just got to believe that you can do it. There's no reason why this guy, I'm not that smart. I know I look really smart, but I'm not, right? <laughs> uh, I, but if this guy can do it, yeah. then anybody can do it, right? Yeah. I have ladies that are in their 70s doing land deals. I have people that have English as a second language that are doing land deals. People that live in Europe doing land deals in the United States, like, Kids, kids can do it. So it's like, you just need to suspend belief for a minute yeah, and just think, like, and maybe I'm gullible, I don't know. But like, I always look at people and like, if she can do it, if he can do it, then I can do it. Why not? Right? Yeah. Like who's, why can't I do it? So I, I think the biggest way to overcome fear is just believe, tell yourself that I can do it. Here, good analogy. I, I was in, Northern Arkansas one time camping with some buddies and uh, we went caving. Do you ever go caving when you like you're crawling? I did it once in Belize. Yep. With a headlamp and everything. And yep. you have to crawl through these spaces, right? Yep. 
you have to stop and like close your eyes and take some deep breaths because it's really easy to freak out and get it can be tough. Right? Yes. Yes. So, you know what I did? Uh, I looked at everybody and I saw the guy that I thought was fatter than me and I got behind him. Right. And I knew if he could crawl through that hole and if he could oh, make it, then I could make that it. That right? is so perfect. So we were in a group of about 10 guys and I was always behind him. And, uh, and I told him later, like, man, I, you just, you saved my life. Cause if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been able to do this. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, I just, I picked the guy that was fatter than me. And I, and he was so mad that I had told him that, but like, if he could get his fat butt through there, then I can. And the, you look at some of these things that we were going through. Like there was this thing called the corkscrew and you, you had to go down, down head first and, and twist your body to get into this thing. Mm. And again, if he could do it, then I could do it. And he was going, but he was probably doing the same thing with whoever was in front of him. But I didn't want to get behind a little kid or some lady like yeah. that was smaller than me. Yeah. So I got behind the fat guy. And it, it, I had a blast. It was really a lot of fun. You know, we saw some beautiful caves and you have to, you know, there was only about three places where it's really hairy. And so that's what you need to do. Find the fat guy Find and get behind guy. him or her. And if like, if he can do it, then I can do it. There's no reason why. There, there is no better way to end this podcast. Get behind the fat guy. That that might find its way into the title of this podcast episode. Just so you know, Joe, uh, <laughs> brother, I love it, man, uh, dude. Uh, I, I want to publicly acknowledge you, man. Thank you for the friendship. Uh, thank you for for kind of being a thought leader and educator in our space for simplifying things. And uh, yeah, guys, uh, obviously, I endorse Joe uh, and everything he does. Um, he's been at this for a while and he's just kind of laid out a very proven, simple system anybody can follow to make money. And so follow the fat guy. I love that. That's yeah. the I'm never going to forget that now. Follow the fat guy. Uh, so guys, uh, I appreciate you tuning in here. We're going we're gonna to call this one a wrap. Um, make sure that you're subscribed so that every single Monday morning uh, you're notified when new episodes on the Flip Empire show come out. Um, got some really exciting, cool guests coming up for you. And I also got some interesting things I'm going to share with you from my storage journey. Uh, just sold a storage facility about six weeks ago, getting ready to sell another one on Friday. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of cool things going on that I'm happy to share with you in the coming weeks. So make sure that you're plugged in. And with that being said, I will connect with you on the next one. Thanks a lot, Joe. Hope you enjoyed that episode, but before you go, you know, I've had a lot of people recently reach out to me wanting to learn more about Ascend, wanting to understand how the mastermind component works, how the coaching relationship works. And so right now we're actually on a waiting list, but what I would encourage you to do is if you think you're the right fit and you think you could benefit from being a part of our community, head over to ascendyoursuccess.com, watch the short video, and then just click the apply to join button below. And then we'll be in contact with you if and when a spot opens up. So really appreciate you listening to Flip Empire here. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next show. Take care.